Right then, as much as it's frustrating making this content, um, I have to explore the options. That's what I do as a, a creator. I I look at, I scout report people. That doesn't mean I think every player that plays for the club should get off and we should sign all of these South American kids that I've scouted. But when there's rumours about managerial changes or even um, board level changes, I, I look into them and I try and evaluate them, right? I'm not happy doing this. I think far, 18 months, Eric Ten Hag's been here, 18 months. And in that time, he's overseen the, he, he had the fallout from the Super League, which was kind of still happening as he arrived. He had the Mason Greenwood situation, the Sancho situation, the Ronaldo situation, the Harry Maguire situation, the Marcus Rashford situation. Some of this might have been his doing. Some of this is not his doing. He's had Casemiro decide to just completely fall off a cliff. He's had Anthony Martial just decide to just not show up for work anymore. Like, there's been so many issues. We basically rely on on Johnny Evans to be our best centre half at the moment because everybody else is injured. There's been a regime change. There'll be all sorts of pressure and uncertainty from his point of view about how that's going to shake out and, and what that means and, and etc. So I don't make content because I would like to put pressure on Eric Ten Hag to go. And I don't think that me looking at some of the candidates that might replace him, if he goes, is adding to that. I think Ineos have made the decision on what the parameters will be on whether or not he keeps his job or not. And it might be reliant on results between now and the end of the season. The deed might have already been done in terms of they might have decided they were sacking him. They might have decided that they were giving him at least till the end of his contract, which is next summer, right? I don't think me exploring potential options really adds any gravitas to any of that in my opinion. Now, I think his future is under threat. I also think 18 months is such a short amount of time to see your long-lasting, real tangible change. And we've looked into, we did a 100-game review last week. You know, the numbers on the, the outside were, were really, really good. The underlying performances have still got holes in and question marks in. But someone threw me a real interesting stat, which was the number of changes in a starting eleven that um, both Arteta and Klopp were able to oversee after two years versus the 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 number of changes in a in the Manchester United first team. So regardless of money spent, because that's always something that gets flung around, but we already know that in the eighteen months that he's been here, the amount of money spent has been. It's been huge, but the number of players bought has been pitiful. And arguably, two of the best signings that we've had were free. Christian Eriksen and Johnny Evans. Half of his signings have been loans that haven't lasted here very long, whether that's Sabitza or Regulon or, you know, Vagost or half of the others that we've had on loan. Like... This isn't a man that's able to bring people in and build them into the system that he's trying to play because they, the ones he has have then either got injured or had to go away again. So I, I got a lot of um, I got a lot of patience for seeing what could happen. And that's not to say I'm blind to some of the issues, structural issues in the way we play that are evident. Structural issues in the way that we've allowed so many shots this season. That was there from the start of pre-season and hasn't been rectified at any point. The only time we saw a real effort to rectify that was at the Etihad where we still allowed that many shots, but we actually looked like we were trying to play off the back foot a little bit. Those are things that I expect the manager to fix. I don't expect the manager to decide how much wages we pay someone. I don't expect him... To, to dictate how much we pay in a transfer fee for somebody. That's not his job. He's been let down in that sense by people above him. He goes, I want that player, or I want X player, and then they go and find him. But because of the incompetences of everybody surrounding him at United, surely the fact that we've only signed people that was in his fucking WhatsApp groups tells you that the, he's been let down. And then you hear the, the reports from the scouts. I actually heard something similar because I asked, 
about Schlotterbeck. Because I was like, I'm sure this is a left-side centre-half that I think he's going to the very top and I think he's got everything. And he was at Freiburg and he would have cost us fucking nothing. And I inquired through various means at Old Trafford and said, what, what's, what's the word on this guy? Is he someone we could get? And the response came back saying, we've got reports on him, we don't think he's top class. Oh, we don't think he's going to be top class. Which is what they said about Erling Haaland. So I would wonder if the people that are in these recruitment positions at United know what fucking day it is. Because all we've seen so far is that they, they don't have a fucking clue what they're looking at. So United have been linked with a mystery coach in a way i think they're also cooking up something i think their target list whether or not they replace ten Hag now next summer or a few years into the future i think that they're going to put together a list of potential candidates and i think those candidates will have to tick a certain amount of boxes and i think one of the boxes that they need to tick is being innovative and tiago motta is a real interesting name um, and I think no matter who you appointed at Manchester United, there is an element of risk. Um, and obviously there is boom or bust potential with, with any coach. Um, and I think there's a serious potential boom with somebody like Thiago Motta. Now, he is one of the most promising coaches in European football. And he has actually transformed Bologna in 12 months. And Motta obviously had a, a career that commands respect, I think. And his emergence as a coach, I would argue it's not being plain sailing, and I kind of like that. I think there's, there's character built in, in being able to say that you've, you've, you've had trials and tribulations that you've had to overcome. He was ridiculed following a 2018 interview in which he discussed the idea of playing a 272 formation. But he was in fact referring to the lineup um, horizontally, with seven players, including the goalkeeper, um, lining up through the center of the pitch, flanked by two players either side. So it's just a really bizarre, like normally we go back to front, 4-4-2, four, 4-3-3, four, 3-5-2. Two, four, three, 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 two. If you're Louis van Gaal, you will say 1-4-3-3. Three, three. <laughs> one, four, two, three, one. I don't know why Louis always included the one in there. Uh, maybe it's a Dutch trait, because I know the Dutch uh, heavily favour the, the goalkeeper being used in the build-up of, of everything to do with football. Um, so it's, it's interesting the way he sort of lined it up like that. Um, he positions the two wide players in the wide areas and seven centrally, and that gives him the 2-7-2 formation when it gets looked at on a different angle, horizontally. The misinterpreted quotes that he said quickly got taken out of context, and I guarantee this is the sort of shit that'll get dragged out by all of the tabloids and all the fucking lad bibles and all of them lot, because they, they just won't understand it. Um... Those comments have followed him throughout his managerial career, and you can guarantee if he rocked up at Old Trafford, the press conference, some fuckwit would ask him about that without actually understanding what was going on. However, under Mar, Bologna have developed the system into being one of the most progressive teams in Italy. They shifted from their 3-5-2. 3-5-2 is a really popular formation in Italy. It has been for 30 years. Well, he shifted that into uh, a 4 2 3 1. And his side now look to dominate games. They exert pressure on the opposition through the control of the ball. They have the third highest possession share in the division, 57.1%. Uh, they also attempt the second most passes in Syria. Like, the metrics are strong. Possession is facilitated by constant rotations they utilize space they look to provide progression between the lines he deploys 
quite a few modern principles. The side are constantly looking to create third man combinations. They seem to try and get numerical superiority over the opposition, try and overload specific areas. That lets them bypass uh, the press, it allows them to work the ball into dangerous positions. And only three teams have recorded more forward passes than Bologna um, in Serie A across 23 24. And they've completed more passes in their own half than any other side in the Italian top flight. And this isn't his first foray into management. It's not even the first time he's managed in Serie A. He had a short stint in charge of PSG's youth team. He was offered to take the role of Genoa. They finished bottom of the league. Another job, this time in charge of Spezia, followed. And they, they barely avoided relegation. So success has not been immediate. He, he doesn't necessarily have the Midas touch. But I think with the right players and the right structure and the right system, he's got tactical principles to his credit, which he definitely sticks to. Bologna's the first team that's really managed to transform into something that resembles the style of a top club, whilst arguably not really being a top club and certainly not necessarily having a wealth of talent available to him. Now, the starting formation of Motta's teams um, is probably the first noteworthy detail in terms of his tactics. The base structure is 4-3-3, but he is known for that very, very adaptable approach, and he shifts between formations depending on the situation in the game. Now, for instance, this 2-7-2, which you're going to hear about a lot, the goalkeeper acts as the first midfielder, or it can be a 4-5-1 when sitting in a low block. And the first time that he publicly spoke about the 272, he was, like I said, he was ridiculed. But basically, it's adaptability. And I get what he's saying. I understand what he's saying. It's look, a, a, one of the basic principles of football is you always want to be strong down the middle and try and push the opposition to the wider areas. And you want to, you don't necessarily want to just flood crosses into your box, but you don't want them to just run through the middle, which is very much what's happening at Manchester United at the moment. Now, you will see this season, if you go and start watching anything that Bologna have done, they will start being quite conservative, 4 2 3 one 4 3, three sometimes. In possession, they will go to what looks like a lot more of a modern kind of principle. Um, and then it might switch to uh, a 3 two, two, 3 Sometimes that'll look as a two, three, two, three. These are the shapes that you see in City put up, Arsenal put up. You, you saw United trying to put these up at the start of the season and then it got abandoned with a quickness. In defence, they'll regroup and it'll go, interestingly, 4-4-2. Four, 4-4-2 four, two. Four, four, two is, is the best defensive shape. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because it's easy to just line up along that structure. But the, the thing with the... The 4-4-2, and you see some of the more progressive shapes in the opposition half. Whether you're defending in a 4-4-2 low block or you're trying to pile pressure on the opposition going forward, there's still six players in the centre of the pitch. Or, as Motta would say, seven players in the centre of the pitch because he's including the goalkeeper as well. But it's something that lots and lots of coaches work on. A lot of people think when a coach is on the sideline, and a lot of you get fucking annoyed with me for referencing the amateur football team that I coach, but I literally decided to create the content and do what we do with Stratford Paddock because I wanted to learn more about the game. And I, and I have learned more about the game. I want to share the things that I've learned because I've learned them by going doing this thing, right? Now, when I'm on the sideline, I don't know what you guys look at when you're watching a team, but one of the literal things that I look at, and it's there's probably the two players that I speak to the most we, we play 4-2-3-1, right? The two players that I will talk to the most are the, the two midfielders. And I am constantly just titivating them back into the right position. And it's it's a metre, two metres, three metres, where it's out of the wrong position. But I always find when we are strong through the core like that, it doesn't really matter where my fullback is. It doesn't really matter where my winger is. It doesn't really matter where... The, the striker's generally going to be in the middle. If he goes over onto one side and he doubles up, I, I do like the other winger to come down in the middle. So I understand the desire for six players, or seven as Motto would call it, down the centre of the pitch. Because, yeah, if my keeper's fucking in the half space, it's probably a bit of a fucking issue, isn't it? Now, 
defensively, the system that Mota has with Bologna at the moment does have that sort of high press with controlled sort of positional defending, as often the case. And it does sometimes have major risks when doing it. Any team that tries to press high, well, for starters, you're going to have to play on the halfway line of what you can't have a deep line, fucking acres in midfield, and then you're forward free doing like a Carlos Tevez impression, just fucking chasing after everything like a puppy dog in the wind, right? There has to be structure to it. Can't press on your own. The least you can press with is two. Ideally, you need three. And behind that, there has to be someone covering the obvious passes. Because the obvious passes are that next phase in midfield. And if you can block those passes off, or at least mark those players, it gives you a 50-50% chance of winning the ball back for a rough pass that comes in. What you're really trying to do when you press like that is either win the ball back there and then, that's the best option, or have someone hit just a fucking send it long and, and hope for the best, where if you've got quick center halves you'll just collect that ball and you'll start a possession cycle from there. Now, they're proactive. They aim to win the ball back quickly after losing possession. That's a principle you've you've seen for... I could even argue Strikes Ferguson's teams used to do this, but it really got, you know, it really got a thing after Pep put a seven seconds on it that he wanted that Barcelona team to win the, the ball back. And that involves your generally coordinated movements. The front three will have pressing triggers. They'll try and close down passing lanes. They'll assume high pressure positions high up the pitch. If and when, because let's be honest, it's pretty 50-50 when pressing, whether you actually get it or not, which is good, but still. If and when the initial press gets bypassed, they transition into trying to go into that 4-4-2 defensive structure. The back four go narrow and compact. And yeah, you might give the, the fullback over there a little bit of room, or the winger over there just a little bit of room. That's cool, because no one gets through this little gap here. We're strong in the middle, and we push them out wide, and we might slide over to the left to get over there, but we're strong in the centre. And then they'll tuck in narrow, and they'll, they'll, they'll sort of slide throughout the channels. Central defenders will do what central defenders do, which is try and track forward runners, anticipate passes, try and keep the line high, try and catch people offside. And I think one of the most exciting features, certainly offensive features, is the use of sort of like micro transitions. When they win the ball back in offensive errors, they've they've got a, a very rapid attacking mode that utilizes one touch passes and I think is is very exciting to watch. And I do I do think it's the sort of style that suits Manchester United and those quick movements can and do catch opponents out of position right in the build-up phase Motta would call this a 4-2-5 uh, again he's just adding the extra one in there um, it's literally a similar shape that I try and build out with, with, with my lads and we are currently in a sort of phase of trying to coach this exact thing so it's quite pertinent um and we use a goalkeeper in build-up as well. I think to, to play out from the back, you have to have goalkeepers that, that can play out from the back. So he calls it a 4-2-5. Um, I call it a 3-2. I, I ignore the goalkeeper, but I shouldn't. And I think maybe Mott is correct on this one, and I'm not. Um, but the goalkeeper will play in between the two centre-halves um, and a box midfield in the middle. So it gives you those options they often drop with the attacking midfielders and they do like using uh the goalkeeper that obviously creates that numerical superiority and that helps them to beat the press but as does a few other things and this is one of the issues i see with my lads which i'm trying to fucking get out of them but it's also an issue i see with manchester united like this weekend if you watch um i mean we've, we've just watched four teams that play out really nice villa Spurs, Liverpool, City. I'd argue Spurs is one of the better ones uh, getting out. Maybe it was because Liverpool's press was a, a touch better than, than Villa's, but this weekend, out of the teams that I saw playing out, I thought Spurs was the more high percentage of them. And one of the reasons that I think they do that, and we're literally going to be working on this this week in training, is someone will play a ball and follow the pass. 
too often when watching Manchester United, you will see one of that back line play a forward pass, ideally on an angle. You want it on an angle rather than a straight, but to be honest, a lot of them are fucking straight, particularly on the left because we don't go to people that are on the right for some reason. But ideally, they play a ball on a nice little diag that is received and it's moved up the pitch, right? But quite often, because teams are man-for-man pressing, teams are well happy leaving five, six men high to try and deal with that press. If teams leave five or six men high, you have to create that superiority. Now, you've already got a bit of superiority with your keeper, but that's only going to work while you're in the box. Your keeper's not going to get giddy like you're playing Pro Evo back in the day and just go on a fucking adventure. So to have true superiority and the aim for every single possession from a restart should be to get over the halfway line with the ball. That I would call that a successful um, goal kick. If you're not getting over the halfway line, you're putting yourself under pressure, right? Your goalkeeper's going to be involved in two passes of that at the most. But what I see with Spurs is they'll play a pass and then one of the centre halves will follow that pass, create a bit of an overload in that second line, and allow them to start moving the ball up the pitch. We're going to be working on that in training this week because I think it's the way that you you need to be able to get out when teams are trying to man pressure. That's how you create the, the overloads is through movement. And if you can play on one, you can't get pressed. So movement plus one touches, short passes, you're not going to get fucked with. Now, again, I see this with Motta and obviously that 425 becomes a 325 as soon as you sort of hit that middle third of the pitch that's where he starts to encourage the rotations and also the third man runs Bologna really emphasized the role of the fullbacks they took inside to help create triangles um the central defenders and midfielders are nice and close to each other don't really like it when the fullbacks go to the wing that feels like the most obvious pressed pass. Oh, the left side centre half's got it. Where's he going to pass it? Oh, to the left back. Mm, okay, nice one. Didn't see that coming. How disguised. That's why you see more and more fullbacks coming into the sort of half spaces. And actually, the, the centre halves are the ones that are going to, to the wing a little bit. Anyway, this is a long fucking video, isn't it? It wasn't meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> but that creates passing option overloads and overloads in certain specific areas and it helps facilitate um ball rotations fullbacks will also provide width later in the build-up that helps stretch the opponent's defense um it opens up space for attacking midfielders and wingers and while comfortable with short intricate passing they're not afraid to go vertical and i think going vertical sometimes is a great option especially if you've got pace in your forward line and Motta does encourage those direct balls when the space opens up. And that's one of the things where you see this to great effect with Brighton and Deserve it because they want to hold the ball in their six-yard box and invite that press. As soon as you drag them players forward, there's 20 metres of space right behind that sort of first line. Because I'll tell you this, it's a fucking brave centre-half that's going to step in 25 metres where you're not offside. He, can, he doesn't have offside in his corner to be able to to play with. So the attackers are going to stand right on the halfway line, or a, a metre inside, and they'll just send a ball up to him, and he's off. So you, you can only really have your defensive line go to the halfway line. Any further than that is very, 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 very brave. And I know if you watched Arsenal Sheffield United the other day, fucking El Saliba was about five yards outside the Sheffield United box. Different circumstances. But that's how you got to do it. Now, when it comes to um, the the rest of sort of attacking philosophy, they do have a bit of a balance between both being positional, but also being like opportunistic and explosive, which I think suits Manchester United down to the core. They've got a system that does love the the quick combination play, individual skills, also pretty good at set plays, which well, you know my feelings on our set plays. And unlike being a rigid formation, Bologna's attackers operate within interchangeable positions and there's fluidity that creates unpredictability that makes it difficult to defenders to to track a certain player because they don't know who's going to be in their zone at whatever point and I think it's one of the reasons why um, Lewis Ferguson midfielder is one of the team's top scorers 
And I would say that they value that collective movement. Motter acknowledges the importance of individual talent. And I think at clubs like United, that's always something that, that works. We've always had a talisman. We've always had a bit of a superstar about us. You know, Anhoutovic has just gone in there and, and been allowed to shine. Totally rejuvenated his career, um, leading to the transfer to Inter Milan. And now, um, Bayern Munich youth player, Xerxes, has, has been given a, a similar sort of free reign. And he's shot onto the shortlist of loads of top clubs around Europe. Bologna's like devastatingly quick transition from defence to attack is a big, big weapon. And I think that's what's elevated them to being one of the better teams in Italy. When they was dog shit. Now, there are United links. It's team talk, so admittedly it's not the number one link that you would want to see. Um, but supposedly Motta has been discussed internally. Now, we're not going to know the re- the outcome of that, are we? Obviously. Um, but presumably the likes of Dave Brailsford, Jean-Claude Blanc, Barada, you know, maybe the latter can't officially begin work until he finishes his gardening leave. Gardening's going to look fucking sick, in it, by the way? Um... But, you know, he has made the name for himself and he's following a similar sort of route that, you know, the similarly linked United target of uh, De Zerbe. Now at Brighton. Had a similar sort of stellar rise at Sassuolo. And I think that free-flowing, tactically rich football has earned him plenty of admirers home and abroad. And um, I'll have to go and have a look if Ashworth is involved, actually, in the recruitment of De Zerbe. Um, I'm pretty sure he was there at the time. But either way, he's going to be familiar with the recruitment processes that were at Brighton, which were surely the sort of things that identifies up-and-coming managers that can do a, a bit. And I think, you know, there's not many outstanding candidates for me. Um, but Motto would represent one that I think, at least from a tactical point of view, would be interesting. Um, for sure. Anyway, like I said, I, I, for me, it's it's Ten Hag's job to lose. Um, and I ain't asking for that to be changed. But if we're going to be looking at alternatives, then I would like to look in depth at the alternatives and try and give you some genuine reasons for why I think they're good or I think they're shit. Now, I'm not even going to bother doing that with Gareth Southgate because surely you've all got eyes. Um, But anyway, thanks for tuning in as always. I'll catch you in the next one. Laters. Hey, thank you for watching the video. If you are new around these parts, then don't forget to subscribe. My channel is proudly supported by my community on Patreon. If you'd like to get a little bit of extra content, a Discord group, meetups, five-a-side games, weekly podcasts, behind the scenes, and even an occasional bit of transfer news as and when I get it, then for the price of a pint, you can show your appreciation for the content that we make and get some goodies for doing so as well. Check the link in the description or click the button right here. You'll also find all of my socials here too if you want to follow me on any of those platforms. Nice one.